Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're just gonna give everyone a second to join the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Just giving everyone a few minutes to join the webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. Just giving everyone a second to join the webinar and then we'll get started today. Good afternoon, everybody. Just giving everyone a second to join the webinar and then we'll get started. Okay, Rachel, as more and more people join, I think we can get started. Um, give me one second. I just have a request for. There we go. Turned on live captioning. Thank you for the, the, um, the individual who reminded me of that. I appreciate that reminder always. Okay, all right, so we'll get started. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Cooking for Reducing Disease Risk um, edition for type two diabetes. My name is Amy Rosenfeld. I am a registered dietitian and community outreach program manager for Northern Westchester Hospital, which is part of Northwell Health. I have with me a very special guest today. I have Rachel Goldman. Rachel Goldman is the Director of Clinical Care for Northwell Health Center for Weight Management and Diabetes Education Program. She's also a nurse practitioner and diabetes educator. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, thank you for being here. Um, so just some business for those of you who are new to being in the Zoom room kitchen with me. Um, this program is being recorded and we will have the recording sent out by the end of the week. So you can, if you have to leave early or if you wanna look, refer back to it or share it with others, that will be available to you. Um, as time permits, we'll be monitoring the uh, chat and the Q&A for any questions. If you have any questions that are relevant to the discussion, we'll try to answer them in a timely way. For questions that are uh, more pertinent to save to the end, we will do so, but we will try to get to as many questions as possible. We will be demonstrating, I will be demonstrating two recipes today um, while we chat with Rachel, as well as um, I will also explain some nutritional information related to preventing and controlling type two diabetes. If for any reason you didn't receive the recipes today, um, they were sent out via email the past couple of days, uh, please put your information in the chat or at the survey at the end that will automatically pop up on your screen and we'll be sure to send that information to you um, so that you can make the recipes another time. So without further ado, I think we can get started. I see more and more people joining us, but welcome to everyone. And we'll start with some questions to you, Rachel, to set the scene. Let's start with the very basic. What is type two diabetes? Okay. So um, everybody has sugar in their bloodstream. We need sugar in our bloodstream, which we get from taking in food to make energy for our body. And in type two diabetes, we have too much sugar in our bloodstream. Um, we tend to use sugar and glucose interchangeably. So sometimes people will say elevated glucose, but that's the same thing as elevated sugar in the bloodstream. Usually that happens because the pancreas can't keep up and produce the amount of insulin that the body needs to metabolize these blood sugars to help make it into energy. And there's also um, something called insulin resistance. So by the time someone gets diagnosed with type two diabetes, their body doesn't use the insulin that their pancreas secretes as efficiently anymore to control these blood sugars. That was a great explanation. Excellent, thank you. Um, and what would you, how would you explain the distinction between then when you hear type two diabetes versus pre-diabetic or type one diabetes? Like how, what are the dif differences in this mm -hmm. distinguishing characteristics? 
So they all have a similarity in that they're all related to blood sugar, elevated blood sugar. Type 1 diabetes is elevated blood sugar that's due to an autoimmune disease. So even though blood sugars are elevated, like in type 2, it's actually a different disease in itself. Prediabetes is when there is an elevation in blood sugar, but it's not as high as when we diagnose type 2 diabetes. So sometimes people will be diagnosed with prediabetes before they get to the point of having type 2 diabetes. For some people, it's a quicker disease progression or nobody's checked in a long time. So they get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes right away. And as you're explaining that, then it's a good time to talk about screening then. Like how are people screened for type 2 diabetes, say, versus pre-diabetic state? Mm -hmm. And, you know, people hear different clinical tests, like what is a fasting glucose versus a hemoglobin A1C? Mm -hmm. Can you explain all of that? Sure. So um, when everyone goes for their annual physicals, if they have risk factors for type 2 diabetes, um, like family history, um, over 45 years of age, being overweight, their a primary care doctor may run what's called a hemoglobin A1C, which is a three-month blood sugar average. And if that is elevated, they may come away with a diagnosis of diabetes. You may just check a fasting glucose level. Um, for a fasting glucose level, a number less than 100 is considered normal. 100 to 125 is considered pre-diabetes and anything over 126 is considered diabetes. And we do check that more than once. We don't go off of just one reading for that. So an A1C check of um, 5.7 to 6.4 is considered pre-diabetes. Anything above 6.5 is considered to be diabetes. So it sounds like small increments, but those little tiny decibels or decimal points really mm -hmm. matter to explain to, to um, people watching that it really is, you know, it sounds like, well, what's the difference in math between 5.7 and 5.8, but there is mm -hmm. an important distinction yeah, there. Yeah, it correlates to a different blood sugar average range. And can you advocate for yourself to get the A1C? I know that's not standard. How would you recommend going about that? Yeah, I think a conversation with your doctor when you have your yearly physical, if you find that you're concerned because you do have family members with diabetes or are overweight, um, I think that it's a really important thing to bring up with your doctor. A, um, a fasting blood sugar check is very good in that it tells the doctor what your blood sugar is at that moment, but an A1C is nice because it's a three-month average, so you get more information with that. So is it considered more of like the gold standard of, of diagnosing? Yes. And there's other ways to diagnose too. There's something called an oral glucose tolerance test, which we don't do um, as routinely anymore to people who aren't pregnant because we do have this A1C test, which is much more convenient than sitting in a room drinking this sugar solution and being pricked multiple times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems a little bit less invasive. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned some of the risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes. Could you elaborate a little more on, the, on some more of the risk factors? Sure. So certainly family history is very important. If you have an immediate relative that has even type 1 diabetes, type 1 or type 2, you're at an increased risk yourself um, being over 45 years old not being very physically active is also a risk factor. Having a history of something called gestational diabetes. So that's a diabetes that's a little different that's diagnosed in pregnancy and then goes away after the pregnancy. Um, those blood sugar elevations do put a woman at an increased risk of developing type two diabetes later in life. Um, certain ethnic backgrounds. So if someone is Latino or Hispanic, African-American, Native American, Pacific Islander, or, or Asian, there is an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Okay, and it, you mentioned family history. If, you're, if you have someone in your family who has it, is it like automatic that you're going to get it? Or is it a preventable 
illness, even if you do have a family history? Yeah, so it's certainly not automatic. But I think that knowing that you have that family history, you really have to be more careful. So be more careful about your weight, your carbohydrate intake, and also your physical activity. And also just to be on top of going to the doctor and getting your yearly physical to be screened. Because if, um, if you were found to be uh, someone developing prediabetes, we'd be much more aggressive to prevent the development of type 2 diabetes if we knew. So if somebody has prediabetes, it's something that's a little bit more reversible that we can yeah. backtrack and not go into full-blown type yeah. two diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's comforting, <laughs> definitely comforting. <laughs> um, and then we're going to talk all about, just everybody knows the nutrition recommendations and what a carbohydrate is, what you have to watch out for in a few minutes. Um, but Rachel, think about like big picture here. Why is it important to control your blood sugar, control diabetes? What are the long-term or the real health mm -hmm. implications for uncontrolled diabetes. Okay. So um, the blood, the elevated blood sugar itself puts someone at an increased risk of infection. So um, for example, if somebody with diabetes needed surgery, we would want to make sure that their A1C was as low as we could get it before having that surgery to prevent um, infection as a complication, but also urinary tract infections, skin infection, yeast infections. Um, they're at a higher risk. Diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, is the leading cause of blindness, foot amputation, and kidney disease in the United States because the elevated blood sugars affect the very small nerves in the body behind the eyes, in the feet, and in the kidneys. So we really want to make sure that people's blood sugars are controlled so that it doesn't begin to affect those small nerves in the body. Also, people with diabetes are at an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. It's a cardiovascular risk factor. So we're very aggressive with uh, medications to mitigate that risk, such as cholesterol medications. Okay, and a question came through in the Q&A here. How distant of a relative should be the concern? Only one level away, like a parent or sibling, or is it also like great grandparent, great aunt, et cetera? I think having any family history puts you at a slightly increased risk, but a first degree relative um, is more of a risk. Okay, thank you. That's a great explanation. Um, so we're gonna take a little pause from interviewing our friend here and, and do a little bit of the nutritional side of things. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the Di American Diabetes Association recommendations for how to eat and talk about different recommendations and tweaks in the kitchen. And Rachel, feel free to chime in here and see, and see what your opinions are. Um, and then we'll mix it up. We'll do one cooking demo, ask Rachel a few more questions, and then we'll, we'll do another cooking demonstration. Um, so the, the first thing to go over here is the, the uh, plate that is put out by the American Diabetes Association. This is the diabetic plate. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, if you have a family history or if you are pre-diabetic, um, this is just a healthy way of eating all around for everybody um, to follow these nutritional guidelines and um, to practice this as a preventative measure. It's not a diet. Those of you who've seen me in the Zoom room before know I hate the D word. Um, it is a, it's a lifestyle, it's a way of eating. Um, and it's just a, every, finding ways to fit everything in moderation, but in healthy balance and portions. So for reference, when they're talking about a plate, they're talking about a nine inch plate. So that's a salad plate, um, not a traditional American dinner plate, which is now 12 inches in diameter. We wanna talk about nine inches. And the goal is to emphasize non-starchy vegetables, which we're going to talk about what a starchy vegetable is, what a non-starchy vegetable is, and eat those in abundance. So salads and carrots and cucumbers and things like that, filling up half your plate, a quarter of the plate being some type of starch or carbohydrate choice, and then a quarter of your plate being some type of protein um, rich food, which we're going to talk about all of this. And the proportions are really important to understand in terms of balancing your blood sugar. And we're going to talk about why. So non-starchy vegetables are going to not only, uh, we're going to talk about why they're so important. We're going to talk about what is considered to be a carbohydrate, 
limiting carbohydrates, but not avoiding them, <laughs> um, how to choose healthy ones, balancing them with protein and uh, beverages to choose as well. So when we talk about making half your plate full of non-starchy vegetables, these are examples of what we're talking about. Um, they are lower in calories, but also the richest in nutrients fiber, which is very important in controlling blood sugar. I don't know, Rachel, if you want to jump in and talk about that, why fiber is so important in controlling mm -hmm. blood sugar. Sure. So um, fiber helps to prevent the blood sugar spike that you get when you put the carbohydrate into your body. So foods with more fiber, you get a much lower blood sugar spike than foods without any fiber. So foods without any fiber, for example, candy, even if you have the same amount of total carbohydrates as a fruit that has some fiber, there's a much different reaction in the body. Thank you for that. Yes. So that's why it's so important to fill your plate with half a plate full of non-starchy vegetables for that fiber, but also for the nutrition, the vitamins, the minerals to help keep you full and satisfied. Um, it not only helps reduce your risk of diabetes or control your diabetes, but prevent lots of other chronic diseases as well. Um, so the quarter portion of your plate that's carbohydrate, that's what affects your blood sugar in terms of rising and falling. And throughout the course of the day, right, Rachel, our blood sugar is rising and falling, but we want it to be um, hills and level valleys versus mountains and slopes, right? Is that a good way to describe it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so what foods affect your blood sugar? It's a lot of foods, but again, that doesn't mean that carbohydrates are bad. Grains, all grains, whole grains or non-whole grains. Whole grains have the fiber. So it's going to be, again, that gentler rise in your blood sugar that Rachel was talking about. Um, so any grains could be brown rice, oats, whole grain bread, pasta, things of that nature. Legumes, so beans or lentils would fit into that category, or peas. Fruits, dried or regular. Dairy, yogurt and milk. And then your starchy vegetables. So even if it's, though it's a vegetable, it would still fit in that quarter part of your plate. So you could choose either potato or grain, or if you're having rice and beans, they fit together in that quarter of your plate. Um, and starchy vegetables include potatoes, corn, squashes, um, yucca, plantains, parsnips, pumpkins, sweet potatoes, cassava, things that are going to give that starchiness and they're wonderfully healthy for you. They're just things that have to be controlled in smaller portions. And then having a quarter of your plate be a healthy, lean protein. Again, Rachel, do you want to explain the protein correlation with blood sugar control? Similar to the fiber, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's similar to the fiber in that if you eat a carbohydrate alone, you're going to get a much higher blood sugar spike than if you pair it with a protein source. So um, when people are asking for snack recommendations, a lot of times when people ask for a snack, they think of chips or pretzels. And it's much better if you're having pretzels, for example, to have some hummus with it, or even to do half a sandwich because of that protein to prevent that peak of the um, blood sugar. Yes. So that pairing, that fiber protein pairing with your carbohydrates is what is going to give the optimal control, right? Mm -hmm. What we want, the results we want. Um, but also choosing the lean protein, like Rachel said, there's a strong component with um, heart disease and cancers um, in general as a big picture of chronic disease. So you really want to make sure you're choosing the healthier cuts, the leaner cuts of red meat, if you're using it, or uh, that includes pork and beef, really focusing more on lean poultry, fish a couple times a week, uh, low fat dairy products, and really also considering the plant-based proteins. So things like beans and lentils, nuts, edamame, tofu, tempeh, they're going to be heart healthy, but they're also fine for blood sugar control. Um, Rachel, if somebody is a vegetarian or a vegan, you're comfortable with a quarter of the plate being say rice or potatoes and a quarter of the plate being beans. Is that correct? Would that yeah. be your recommendation? Yeah, that's true. And this is all these foods are also have nice anti-inflammatory properties. 
And mm -hmm. part of the issue with diabetes is also inflammation throughout the body, putting people at increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Yeah. So plant-based diet helps it reduce the inflammatory response. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then beverages, you know, there's always, an, the, to, I say to patients, this is a low hanging fruit, a really great way to control your blood sugar um, by switching to water, unflavored seltzers um, as your dominant sources of, of liquids, things like unsweetened uh, uncaffeinated tea and coffee. Um, those aren't great for hydration in large amounts, but okay for blood sugar control in small amounts, things like diet soda and diet drinks. What do you think about those, Rachel? We might have different opinions, but what do you think about them? So, um, there's been some research now that shows that even diet beverages may, um, trick the brain in a way that may promote hunger and may cause some weight gain. So I'm, I'm big into moderation. I don't want people to feel like they're on a diet either. So if every so often somebody has a diet soda, I think that's okay. It's much better than having a regular soda, but try to keep to these other healthier beverages for the vast majority of the time. We're on the same page. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know, that I think artificial sweeteners, I've read a lot of that research as well. Um, and if they're a favorite thing, then save it for a special treat. But in general, I've read the same research. Yes, that it, it, it can make you hungrier, even if there is no sugar or calories in it. Mm -hmm. And I've even since read some research that it can spike your blood sugar in similar ways that the body gets just super confused mm -hmm. by the sweetness. Yeah, so we're learning so much more. We're something called continuous glucose monitors now. So they're a device that you put on the arm or the stomach, and we're able to see blood sugars as people go throughout the day. Some of them are even available through the pharmacies now. So we're really learning a lot about the um, interactions of these different foods and also some of the chemicals that we put in our foods. Yeah, no, it's fascinating and definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, so like we said, all foods fit in moderation, right? It's all about proportion and balance. Um, I think Rachel and I are on the same page of always the freshest, wholest, most natural foods whenever possible as it's affordable to you. You know, frozen fruits and vegetables, perfectly fine. Low sodium canned fruits and vegetables, perfectly fine. There is still a way to eat healthily on a budget even these days. Um, and using healthy cooking methods, you know, avoiding the deep frying is having more of the baking, the, the stir frying, steaming, roasting, grilling. Again, that's about the heart health and protecting your heart in that regard. Um, like I mentioned, bulking up on your vegetables. Uh, these are just some ideas of ways you can get vegetables in. It's now starting, to, at least in New York, to be that cold time of year. So Lots of uh, stews and soups and, and things like that are an easy way to incorporate a ton of vegetables into your diet. It doesn't have to be this cold side of vegetables to fill up the corner of your plate. A warm mug of soup, a vegetable soup could count as your vegetables. Um, you could add vegetables into anything you make. Last night I made a, a rice pilaf to go with roasted chicken for my family. I threw mushrooms and spinach and all sorts of vegetables into the rice because they're a little more flavorful that way. Um, throwing vegetables into your eggs that you cook, your smoothies, um, having half cauliflower rice with half um, regular brown rice. We're gonna talk about that today when we make our lasagna about how to reduce by using vegetables, but still giving you that satisfying feeling. And as Rachel mentioned, the importance of snacking. So that's gonna help keep your blood sugar in check by not having a huge meal in the middle of the day and then a crash a few hours later, eating smaller portions to, to control your hunger and your blood sugar by having, as Rachel mentioned, a protein rich snack, a fiber rich snack, pairing those carbohydrates with a protein or a fiber rich option such as, like Rachel said, hummus. <laughs> we have the same thoughts. Hummus with some pretzels or um, I love also recommending things like guacamole with uh, some carrot sticks is a good example. A hard boiled egg to have with some fruit. Um, uh, popcorn, for example, is another really fiber rich air popped popcorn. Having that perhaps with 
um, your fruit instead of just the fruit in the middle of the day, some peanut butter on an apple. Mm -hmm. Think about these pairings. And again, not an enormous amount, but a small amount to curb your appetite to prevent you from being starving at mealtimes. Because what happens, Rachel, when patients are starving at mealtimes? <laughs> there was that candy <laughs> commercial that's people when they're hangry, um, yeah. especially if you haven't prepped or prepared or thought about your meal in advance, you're grabbing for anything. And usually the easiest foods to grab when you're that hungry are carbohydrates. Yeah, and it's a lot harder to control your portions mm -hmm. when you're starving. We eat with our eyes, we eat with our emotions. Um, and it's very hard to say, I'm gonna have my nine inch sensible plate when you're ravenous. Um, so snacking really, really does help. And then when we talk about sweets, you know, as Rachel mentioned, it's also connected with weight gain, right? So excessive sugar, high sugar options, um, candy, desserts, things like that in abundance, uh, can lead to more weight gain and uncontrolled blood sugar. So we always talk about, you know, having healthy sweet treats, which we're going to demonstrate in a second, um, to satisfy that sweet tooth. If you completely deprive it, it'll probably lead to you craving it even more and eating more in abundance. But if you instead indulge in it, but in a healthy way and save, you know, your chocolate chip cookies and birthday cake for a special treat, it's a lot easier to moderate your sugar cravings. The more sugar you eat, the more sugar you crave. It's a it's addictive and it's a cyclical thing. Um, so having things like fruit dipped in dark chocolate, baked apples with cinnamon um, in the microwave or using flavors, cinnamon, vanilla, and cocoa really help to enhance sweetness without adding a ton of sugar. So it's a there's really great some, way. Um, there's also some research that cinnamon may also help to regulate blood sugars also. There we go. Excellent. Yeah. And Rachel, what are your thoughts about alcohol? Nobody oh. likes it when we limit it, but what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> so moderation. So the American Diabetes Association um, says that one drink for a woman or up to two drinks for a man is okay. Um, depending on medications though for type two diabetes, it's a conversation to have with your provider. Um, the same um, enzyme that metabolizes the alcohol in the liver um, also metabolizes blood sugar. So people might be prone to having low blood sugar hypoglycemia if they're drinking. Um, so there might be some medication changes or there might be advised to eat with the alcohol. Um, also, just with alcohol, pay attention to what you're drinking. Um, the same advice about sugary beverages applies, whether there's alcohol in them or not. So to stay away from um, sodas and fruit juice and alcoholic beverages will also prevent high blood sugar spikes afterwards. Thank you for that. I'm looking at some questions in the chat before we get to our first cooking demonstration. Um, Let's see, do, 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 do. the plate of portions, that's a good question. So there is the American diabetes plate, which is different than my plate, which is the governmental plate um, that has fruit as a component as well. It's not that fruit isn't included in a pre-diabetic or diabetic diet. It's just the emphasis is on more vegetables versus incorporation of fruit. Um, so there are two different plates. Is I there a difference? Say yeah. about um, smoothies in general. So um Nobody would go out and eat a banana and strawberries and an orange all at the same time. That's a lot of sugar. So if you're going to have a smoothie, try to limit it to one piece of fruit and have the rest be the vegetables. Because even if you're drinking the carbohydrates, your body still will recognize them and that will increase the blood sugar. Yes, thank you for that. And it's still better than juicing. No yeah. matter what, it's that juicing is something you want to really limit or stay away from versus smoothies. You're at least getting the whole the fruit and the fiber mm -hmm. um, and always incorporating some vegetables in there as well. Is there a difference if the vegetables are cooked or raw? No. <laughs> um, when you cook them, you know, if you're frying the vegetables, obviously that's not a healthy choice. Um, but or stir frying with a ton of oil, that wouldn't be as healthy. But in moderation, you know, cooking with a one or two teaspoons of oil, sauteing, roasting, grilling, cooked or raw, all wonderful for you. Um, 
I will, and there are a couple of people saying that they are viewing this on their phone and that they want to have a copy of the presentation. I will send it out in an email with the recording when we send out the recording as well. So you'll have a copy of all these slides um, and everything will be there. Um, Rachel, do you wanna look at some of these questions while I get our, our sure. cooking demonstration yeah. set up? So, I see um, a lot of flurry of questions, it's <laughs> awesome. So what are our thoughts on reduced or no sugar cookies? So be really careful when something is marketed as sugar-free, especially something that would normally have a lot of sugar in it, like cookies. Some of these food companies have put in sugar alcohol into the dish instead of conventional sugar. So they are able to say that on the packaging. But if you look at the total carbohydrates on the nutrition label, that's where you're going to see it. I'll have the same amount of total carbohydrates as the regular cookies. So it's a bit of deceptive marketing. Always look at the food labels when you're comparing and look at the total carbohydrate line. That'll give you a sense of um, if this food really is, you know, as healthy as they're marketing it to be. Foods that have more fiber on that under the total carbohydrates are better, less added sugar. In general, for most women, we recommend about 30 to 45 grams of total carbohydrate per meal, and for most men, 45 to 60 grams of total carb carbohydrate per meal for people who have type 2 diabetes. And this is where, you know, working with a diabetic educator like Rachel or her team of registered dietitians can really be helpful because they can help you map out carbohydrate needs for each of your meals and how to practice what's called carbohydrate counting um, with portion sizes and, and reading labels and things like that. Um, I think we could pause in the question so we can start demonstrating our first recipe. I'm so glad that there are so many questions. This is awesome. Um, so our first recipe today is going to be a chocolate mug cake. Uh, mug cakes have become very trendy. So I try to respond to those trends whenever I can. Um, and it's great because it is a, a reduced portion size of cake. Uh, the recipe you have here is for two. So you could either um, split it in half or make one and share with a loved one in your home. So when it's a mug cake, that means you can literally make it in the microwave in your mug. And that's what we're going to do. So I have here in my coffee mug, the dry ingredients. So I have mixed together um, two tablespoons of all purpose flour. You could also use whole wheat flour if you want to, um, or if you're gluten-free, gluten-free flour. Uh, you could use self-rising flour if you want it to be even fluffier. Um, you could also use a uh, like almond flour or something along those lines. I have one tablespoon of really rich, unsweetened cocoa powder. And when I say really rich, the better the quality of your ingredients, the better things are going to taste, especially when you're reducing the sugar. So I have rich, dark Velrona chocolate cocoa powder. There's no sugar in it. It's just really chocolatey because I love chocolate. I have in here a little bit of baking powder, a pinch of salt, and I mix it all together so that my dry ingredients are very well mixed. Now, here comes the easy part. I'm gonna put in all of the wet ingredients and mix it together until it forms a batter. So I'm gonna take two tablespoons of um, low fat milk. I'm using 1%. You could also use um, almond milk, oat milk. Again, unsweetened is always preferable. But make sure if you're using dairy milk, you're using low fat. I'm gonna use one teaspoon of canola oil. I'm going to use um, a little bit of maple syrup. This is two tablespoons of maple syrup mixed together with um, some fresh vanilla extract. And when you get the recipes um, that uh, I sent out and handout, they were analyzed. You can see the carbohydrate counts. Okay, and then I'm gonna add one small egg. And I say small because it really doesn't need a large egg here. And I'm gonna mix this all together. And again, they do sell like pre-packaged mug cakes and things like that. They're gonna have more chemicals. They're gonna have more unfresh ingredients. 
this is like a super fast, um, much more natural way of getting a chocolate fix without all of that extra sugar. I'm using a maple syrup to have more of a natural sugar. It's still sugar, but I'm controlling the amount and I'm taking care of that in terms of what type of sugar I'm putting in there. So you see how it's forming? It looks like a cake mix batter, a brownie batter. I pop that into the microwave for about a minute and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, Rachel, are there good questions in the chat right now that we can there, look at? There are. So um, why is there a difference in only one alcohol for women, alcoholic drink, and two for men. So um, it does metabolize differently. There's diff women have um, less of an enzyme that does help to metabolize alcohol. So that's why there's this discrepancy between gender um, in those um, American Diabetes Association recommendations. And then um, if you're making a fruit salad, does it matter how many fruits you put in? I don't think it matters how many fruits you put in, but there are different portion sizes. So um, for raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, the portion size is about three quarters of a cup is about 15 grams of total carbohydrate, whereas melon is one cup. So there might be some differences between the different types of fruit you put in, but I don't think you're limited to the types of fruits that you pick. Mm -hmm. And and they, and that's where the carbohydrate counting guides and things of that nature can be working with the dietitian or a diabetes educator can be really helpful. Um, berries tend to be a lot lower in sugar uh, and higher in fiber. You can have a slightly larger portion size versus a banana or things of things like that. Um, let me see if there are any other ones here. I think it looks like there are a lot of complaints about the size of the screen. I apologize if you're looking at this on your phone. Um, but again, I will be sending this out to all of you so you have a copy of the recipes. So looks like our cake is done, which is really nice to see. So when it comes out of the microwave, you can either eat it directly from the mug here, that's how it looks, or you can pop it out onto the plate. Again, the portion is two. So I do highly recommend taking it out and portion controlling it. Hold on one second. Let me get back my good view. There we go. Okay. So if you can see my cake here, it's like like a restaurant style cake, right? It looks kind of like a souffle. It's kind of big. So one portion would be half of the cake. I'll show you all here. That's how big the portion still is. Still pretty big, still pretty large. And you could have that with, with um, you know, just as is warm out of the microwave, um, or you could have a little less and have some fruit with it. This is where a little bit of budgetary, budgetary finagling with your carbs comes into play. Like, right, Rachel? Yes, so it's, it's you know, <laughs> moderation here. Moderation, exactly. Um, so before we move on to our second recipe, I have a few more questions for you. You mentioned before like um, physical activity or things like that for lifestyle choices. What other lifestyle choices in your recommendation um, affect your blood sugar control oh. or your guidelines? Mm -hmm. So definitely exercise. Exercise is one of nature's best way to bring down blood sugars. Um, making sure that your weight is where it should be or as close as you could get it to be. To, um, to a healthy weight for you. Getting good sleep. Um, when we don't sleep well, we um, cause disturbances in something called our circadian rhythm, and that affects our cortisol levels. Cortisol is a hormone that everybody has um, that normally raises uh, to wake you up in the morning. But when you get bad sleep, um, those levels come out of whack and that affects your blood sugar. And then also it's, I'm not sure if it's really lifestyle, but taking medications as prescribed, if you're supposed to be taking medicines for diabetes, make sure that you continue to take them for diabetes until you have a conversation with your provider um, after your A1C is rechecked to um, figure out further treatment. Don't just come off because you see that your blood sugars have come back to normal. 
And that's, that's why your blood sugars have come yeah. back to normal. <laughs> One of the many reasons, but there, like we said, there is, there is our patients that, you know, reverse their diabetes or pre-diabetic state. And then that's mm-hmm. why it's so important to have continuous monitoring with your physician, right. To see if yeah. medications are still warranted, dosing, oops, dosing yeah. is appropriate, <laughs> dropping mm-hmm. forks on the floor. Um, yeah. Is that correct? So, yeah, so I got a lot of questions about, you know, I've been diagnosed with diabetes. Is there ever going to be a point where I won't have diabetes anymore? And that's a big concern. And that's very understandable. I think it's better to think about diabetes as being in remission at that point where blood sugars have come back to normal. And I mean, normal as an A1C less than 5.7% at that point. Um, Hopefully by losing weight, exercising, eating right, blood sugars can come back to normal if diabetes is caught in its very early stages. It is possible to normalize that by yourself if you kind of make those hard lifestyle changes. Sometimes bariatric surgery also is um, an interesting way. Um, There's a lot of good evidence that if somebody is a candidate for bariatric surgery and loses the weight, from the bariatric surgery that their diabetes could go into remission. Um, But it's something to continue to look at. It's something that should be monitored at an annual physical or at a um, sooner duration, depending on the situation. Um, But yeah, I would say remission would be more of a a term to be used instead of reversed. That's a really good word. It's a good word to have in your mind, you know, unfortunate association with cancer, right? But it, but it is a good way of reframing it, that yeah. it isn't something you just don't have to deal with anymore. And something the, you always have to be aware of. Yeah, the science behind it is that when someone gets diagnosed with type two diabetes, they're, um, they've lost about 50% of the production of insulin in their pancreas. So it's the beta cells in the pancreas that secrete all this insulin for the body. So there could still be some damage to some of those beta cells, even when the blood sugar comes back to normal. Mm -hmm. And is there a specific recommendation or is is it case by case of how to manage diabetes through medications and um, blood sugar testing and things like that? Yeah, so it's case by case. Um, For the vast majority of people, we want to see their A1C less than 7%. That's an average blood sugar of less than 150. If someone is able to get their A1C lower without causing blood sugars to drop too low, because too low blood sugars could be dangerous also. So if they're able to get below 6.5% without low blood sugars, that is also really great to statistically prevent the development of some of those complications I mentioned, like eye disease, foot disease, and kidney disease. The cornerstone of everything we do for type two diabetes is um, through lifestyle changes like we've discussed, healthy eating and exercise, good sleep, stress reduction, and then medications also to get someone to that, at least that 7%. Um, It used to be that everybody was put on insulin, but Mm -hmm. we have many different pills and also non-insulin injectables now available that are really just amazing at controlling blood sugars, helping people lose weight. And also um, some of them also help reduce the risk of heart disease when they're taken um, for diabetes. So there are some really great options out there. That's amazing. Um, And I think I really like what you said about, you know, the whole thing is a lifestyle. It's a, it's, it's, it, and that's what we're trying to do here from my perspective of the cooking side is that you can still have some of your favorite things and, and enjoy them in a, in a regular way. It's just making some small tweaks and making mm-hmm. um, modifications to make things a little bit healthier and save the indulgences for a special occasion, perhaps exactly. a little bit on Thanksgiving next week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it's really, but it's really fascinating. I think it would be good for people to understand and, and forgive me, you used to be called a diabetes educator. Your specialty is now a certified diabetes care and education specialist. They've changed the name of the credential. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you explain to patients or or people watching like what that is? Like what is a CDC? Yes. So you could just say diabetes educator. Um, It's much, (laughs) much easier. It's much less of a mouthful. 
So um, I'm, I'm a nurse practitioner is my background. Uh, there are diabetes educators who are physicians, nurses, uh, physician's assistants, nutritionists, registered dietitians, um, social workers. And what we've done is we've gone through additional education and training and taken a certification exam so that we, um, we focus on helping people with diabetes learn how to self-manage their disease. Because truthfully, you know, you may come to our office every so often and we give you recommendations, but it's really what you do at home that has the greatest impact. So we want to teach you what to look out for to prevent complications and also a lot of what Amy's discussed in terms of healthy eating and exercise to make sure that um, our patients reach their goals. That's it's a great, it's really important. I think not, to, not too many people know about that specialty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, you know, important for me to give people like you the platform to be able to explain it because I, I think, you know, it's all a partnership. It isn't just going to your GP or general pra practitioner. It isn't just about, um, you know, going to your specialist. There are, it's a care team. It's a care team for everybody to work together. And, and the diabetes educator really helps to like pull it all together. Like how Am I correct in, in yeah, so helping work, to manage everything? Yeah, so we, we work with people's primary care doctors, their endocrinologists, their nutritionists. We, we do try to pull it all together to try to make sure that when you do go for those office visits that you're only seeing good numbers on the blood tests and that you're, you're really reaching your goals. Yeah, and it's a, it's a complex and mm -hmm. challenging thing, but it is manageable and, and sounds like diabetes education really helps with that. Mm -hmm. um, so to that end, do you recommend that people with diabetes work with all these different providers or what, what's your recommendation for that or prevention um, as well? So, so yeah, so there's different, um, as we mentioned, there's different types of diabetes. Mm -hmm. I think that your great point person is your primary care provider. So having a discussion when you get some abnormal blood sugar laps back or an abnormal A1C to see where they would direct you to. Um, working with a diabetes educator, whether it's a nurse practitioner like myself or a registered dietitian is very helpful. Um, if someone has a very high A1C or a difficulty getting the blood sugars down, there's also endocrinologists who specialize in diabetes management that are an important part of the care team. And um, your primary care doctor could help direct you as to what the next step would be. And can you explain to everybody what Northwell's, the center that you direct, the Center for Weight Management and Diabetes Education, what does that program do and how can they help people with um, mm -hmm. diabetes? So um, we have a program now, a Center for Diabetes Education, and um, we have different locations. We have one in Sleepy Hollow, one in White Plains, one in Katona, we're gonna have one in Chappaqua Crossing at the beginning of next year, where uh, we have teams of diabetes educators able to see people who are newly diagnosed with diabetes, have uncontrolled diabetes, or people with pre-diabetes, people who just have questions about their <laughs> blood sugars. So we are available. Um, we do collaborate with many different specialties, so primary care, endocrinology, surgeons also if there's blood sugar issues so we really try to like you said kind of fit all the pieces together um, to help our patients um, manage this very complex disease excellent and um we will put all this referral information when we send out the recording and the recipes um, but for those of you who are here it the phone number for all the offices is 914-821-5350 um, and that would, and again, this would um, also be an option if you would like to schedule an appointment or seek information about a referral, the survey that will pop up when this program is over, you can put your information in there and we will make sure to direct it to the office, keep it confidential and help you get set up with that. Um, so we will get started on our next recipe and then we'll try to get to as many more questions in the chat as we can. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, it's, it's all about lifestyle here um, and how I mentioned as well. And what I really like to do for diabetes related programs is teach a way to have your favorite foods in a new way. Um, so 
the last time I taught this program last November, um, somebody asked me if they if I found zucchini noodles on their own satisfying as a substitution for regular noodles. And I honestly said, no, not in a complete substitution, but there is a way to do it where it is satisfying and still providing you with some necessary carbohydrates, which do fuel your brain, your muscles. Um, we, we can't be carb free. We need some. Um, so I wanted to remake a lasagna recipe where showing you how to use zucchini as layers as well as noodles because it isn't about avoiding pasta it's about reducing the amount of pasta okay so i'm going to tilt my screen down here rachel if questions come through about the lasagna just shout them out as i'm as i'm going okay um so what i have here is a small casserole dish that i have put um, a layer of sauce on the bottom. And that's kind of to prevent the sticking. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. So I put low sodium, fresh tomato sauce on the bottom. I am using a jar. You could use store pot if you wanted to, um, as long as you're choosing a low salt, low sodium option. And I'm going to show you how to assemble it. I am using a meat lasagna, but you could make this vegetarian. I'm using tur lean turkey meat um, and I'm using lots and lots of vegetables. So I'm gonna start with, I use no cook lasagna noodles because I think it's a lot easier than boiling noodles and they come out perfectly al dente. So I'm putting th th um, two noodles there and then my, my casserole dish is just slightly too big for it to go straight across the other way. So I'm doing a layer of three noodles and then I have low fat ricotta cheese. Um, you could also um, use uh, pureed tofu. I've done that before too, to increase the protein and reduce the saturated fat. The ricotta cheese is mixed with an egg because it kind of helps to be the glue. And I'm gonna layer um, a couple of tablespoons of ricotta cheese on the, on the bottom on top of my noodle. And I'm starting with a noodle layer because it gives it more of a solid base. Um, that's why I'm doing that. I have sauteed some onion and some mushrooms. You could use whatever uh, vegetables you want. I would just always recommend cooking them a little bit so they aren't um, super watery when you put them into your dish. Uh, you could use um, you could use spinach. You could use really whatever your family enjoys. So I put a layer of mushrooms and onions, and then I'm going to put a layer of totally cooked through ground turkey meat. Again, you could skip this. Um, you could use ground chicken. It does, you know, beef lasagna would be more of a special treat. It would definitely be higher in calories um, and higher in saturated fat. I'm going to sprinkle some shredded mozzarella cheese, some low fat shredded mozzarella cheese here. The only part about lasagna that's tricky is getting all the, the components done. And then once you've done that, you just layer. Um, so this is a great recipe for a holiday or a make ahead. You know, Rachel and I are both busy working parents. <laughs> it's a good thing to have um, uh, ready to go for the end of the day. And it actually keeps better when you make them ahead of time. So I put a layer of my sauce and now I'm gonna repeat, but here's the trick. I'm not gonna go back to noodles. I'm gonna go with my roasted zucchini. So I've cut zucchini into quarter inch layers here. And I'm using that as my layer in between noodles. Okay. So instead of having a whole box of lasagna noodles in this recipe, I'm using half a box of lasagna noodles in the recipe, which is a lot less carbohydrates. You could also use eggplant as your layer that works also really nicely. Um, it's a, it's a good solid base. And then I'm gonna repeat it all over again. So I'm gonna take my ricotta cheese and spread it just like I would have if it's a noodle. And the most important thing is to roast the zucchini ahead of time so that it isn't super, super watery. I'm gonna add my mushrooms here. There we go. Add the meat. Add 
of the sauce. And if you mess it up, like I just did them in a different order, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. It all tastes good in your belly. Another layer of cheese. And then I would go back to the lasagna side and just repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, you're gonna bake this in the oven at about 350 uncovered, 325 if you wanna be super cautious or if your oven's really hot. And when it comes out of the oven, magic of television, here's what it looks like, okay? So basically everything is cooked. You are just bubbling it to get the, cas the casserole to set. Um, and you have a, a lovely lasagna here. You could um, cut them in pieces and freeze them individually. Um, it, the recipe makes a lot. It makes for about 10 servings or 12 servings, I think. Um, so you could definitely um, cut them up and have them in individual portions. Like I said, it does really uh, keep very well. Um, or if you're making it for your family, it is serves a large amount of individuals. And then you can um, uh, serve it with a very large salad, bulk it up, have some more vegetables with it. And it is still satisfying lasagna feel without a ton of extra carbohydrates, the right portion. What do you think, Rachel? It looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> looks delicious. I'm probably making you hungry. And then of course you have your, your chocolate cake to finish it off with. Um, so a satisfying, rich meal that's been lightened up considerably. Um, and let me see if there are questions that came through here while, while um, I was cooking. Okay, is using whole wheat in this recipe help? Yes, so you could, I was not able to find whole wheat no cook lasagna noodles this time, but there are whole wheat no cook lasagna noodles and that would be even better. That would be the gold standard. Um, is the turkey fully cooked or partially cooked? It is fully cooked. You always wanna fully cook your meat before layering it into the lasagna. So any meat that you used, you would fully cook through. Um, Pepito melon considered a starchy vegetable. I believe so, but I would have to double check. Rachel, do you know that offhand? I don't. I'd have to look that up. Um, okay, let me see. Other questions here. If you're making a smoothie with strawberries and bananas and making it into two portions, is that fine? So I would always recommend, again, remember the protein rule. You have the fiber rule, but I would have the protein rule. So I would definitely add some yogurt or add some, which also actually, unless it's plain, would have considerable amount of carbohydrates. I would add some peanut butter if you can, or almond butter to really balance it out and neutralize. I would also consider adding some spinach. You can't taste it, I promise, if that's a concern for you. Um, my children devour it and have just love that it turns it a interesting color, um, but I would definitely add some protein along with it because just the bananas and the strawberries are going to spike your blood sugar. Would you agree with that, Rachel? Yes. Okay. Um, someone said that microwave food is bad for you. Our meat and vegetables is good. There's a lot of misconceptions about microwaving. Um, I would say it's perfectly fine to use your microwave. Um, nothing's, no studies I've read have actually shown that it's dangerous in any way. Rachel, same for you. I agree. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's, we have to cook our foods in some ways. So um, I think that that's a much better alternative than, you know, frying, for example. Yes, exactly. Um, and perhaps more enjoyable than raw if that's not your preference. And more practical too. Sometimes you just need to get things done quickly. Yes. Uh, what size plate did you say was the reference plate? Nine inches, so a salad plate. In our house, we basically only use salad plates except on holidays. Um, speaking of hummus, are beans considered starchy vegetables? Yes, beans are considered pro starchy protein or a starch. So they can go in either direction. They Hummus has proportionally, you, you can look up the carbohydrates as a portion size of hummus. Um, it is high in protein and the portion size of hummus is small because it is also high in fat from the tahini, um, unless you're making it yourself and omitting the tahini. But I would say keeping your portions to one or two tablespoons as a snack choice, pairing it with vegetables or some uh, like half an apple, sliced apple, apple and hummus actually are a really delicious combination. Um, 
would be fine. Rachel, would you agree with that? I would. I looked at the Pepino melon also, and there's a, for an entire medium melon, there's about 9.2 grams of total carbohydrates. So that's pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, that's certainly not considered a fruit um, in that sense that it would greatly elevate the blood sugars. And I doubt you would eat the entire melon at one sitting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for looking that up. Thank you. Um, and then our last question here, do you need to quote, cover the lasagna with foil before baking. I'm assuming you're talking about the lasagna. Um, I actually don't. I cook it for a shorter period of time just until it's bubbling. Um, you can, when I've covered it with foil, I've, I've had the top layer of cheese just come right off and had bad results, but you certainly can. That is definitely a method I've seen a lot of people do. Um, I just use lots and lots of tomato sauce. <laughs> There's a question here something? about um, metformin. Are there other drugs to treat other than metformin? And the answer to that is absolutely. There's many other uh, medications out there. So depending on other medical conditions, and again, um, weight could be a factor in choosing medication. Um, there are some really good options. Metformin is usually the first line treatment, but we do combine that with other medications. Or sometimes if there's negative side effects, we skip metformin and go to something else. Well, thank you, Rachel. We're, we're at 101. So I think we're all done for today. But um, thank you so much for being with us today. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. And I think, I think others did too, based on the flurry of responses in the, in the question and answer here. Um, and again, if anybody is interested in scheduling, oh, do you want me to show the finished lasagna again? Yes, I can do that. I can do that. There we go. Um, if anybody is interested in scheduling an appointment, there will be a survey that pops up automatically on your screen. We kindly ask you to fill it out regardless of whether or not you want an appointment because they really do help inform feedback for us. Um, so please do that. There will be a webinar link recording that is emailed out to everybody. It is a link to our YouTube channel to response um, to the question in the chat. So you will get uh, that by the end of the week. We thank all of you for joining us and um, we hope you enjoy the recipes and the rest of your day. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you.